Good morning, everybody. This is a live emergency briefing as we have uh, major updates to the severe weather set up today. It looks like the northern mode is dominating. Yesterday, there was definitely a battle between the southern mode down in Kansas and the northern Oklahoma and the northern mode across uh, southeastern Minnesota in uh, northern Iowa, and it looks like the uh, northern jet streak is dominating with an attendant surface low that is forecast to deepen as it moves in to uh, northwestern uh, Iowa there. Uh, there's actually snow happening in part of the uh, marginal severe weather risk across uh, north central Iowa uh, so far this morning. I can show that to you here uh, with this surface map. And look at that snow. The temperature is 37 degrees uh, here, but there are some OBS uh, that are reporting some snowfall here across northwestern Iowa. This is probably just to the west of where that surface low is forecast to track. Off to the south of there, you can see dew points rising into the 50s. Temperatures rising into the low 60s already with a lot of clearing with a big-time stout elevated mixed layer. So dry air just above the ground surging along just to the south uh, side of that surface low and near that surface low is causing major major clearing uh, here across western Iowa, and that's going to continue through the day today. But there is quite a bit of precipitation and some uh, cool, stable air here across southern Minnesota. That's going to be a, one limiting factor for the tornado threat is just how prime that warm frontal zone can be for the existence of surface-based supercells. And that warm front is, uh, and right along that surface low track is where the wind shear is going to be most favorable uh, for those tornadic supercells. Right now, the HRRR, is forecasting that surface low to eject through northwestern Iowa into southern Minnesota. And then at around 20 to 21 Z, that's going to be about 3 p.m., that's when storms start to initiate across south central Minnesota, where temperatures right now are in the upper 30s to the lower 40s there. So there's a lot of stable air to the north of that. Winds are to the northeast. Uh, to the north of that warm front, to the south of the warm front, quite a bit of uh, destabilization happening here. And uh, it seems like we're getting a lot of parallels to the 2011 season, except earlier, it doesn't uh, seem like we're going to be experiencing that delay to the start of the severe weather season that we had in 2011, where April 9 really began the big-time uh, record-breaking uh, month of April during 2011 with over 700 tornadoes we were chasing up across northwestern Iowa uh, on that day. The Mapleton, Iowa tornado event on April 9, 2011. Numerous tornadoes through the night, too, that were quite visible with those supercells across northern Iowa that happened on that night. I'm not saying that that's going to happen today. We're a little bit earlier in the seasonal cycle, but very similar. We've got winter meeting spring uh, with uh, some stable air, uh, even some snowflakes happening across portions of far northwestern Iowa. And there definitely is a tornado p uh, threat with any of these uh, supercells that can develop across south central Minnesota at about 3 p.m. and about a two to three hour window there, probably 3 to 5 p.m., where I think that there is a tornado threat across southern Minnesota stretching into the southeastern portion of the state right along that surface low track. Uh, this is where the forecast uh, surface low is expected to be at 20 Z. So this is at 2 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. This is the wrap uh, forecast mean sea level pressure showing you uh, where that surface low uh, is forecast to be at that time. Uh, and look at that surface low dropping in to about 996. The HRRR has a 995 low, even deeper than this. Uh, that low centered right over northwestern Iowa uh, by this time with that warm front lifting northward into southern Minnesota. You can see all these little showers here uh, developing with the isentropic lift to the north of that warm front. Gizmo's fired up about this setup too. She's wondering why the hell we aren't up there right now. But I was uh, focused on the southern plains yesterday and the multiple days of storm chasing ahead. It looks like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, Friday and Saturday in Oklahoma, Sunday off to the east in eastern Arkansas toward the lower Mississippi River Valley. Then it looks like early next week could get active across portions of Dixie Alley once again as well. So realizing those multiple days in a row of severe weather, my plan was to head uh, to southern Kansas and chase a nocturnal severe weather threat tonight. Uh, then when the models came out, I was even thinking about heading to Colorado to chase that snow event, but I've got to be focused on the warm sector. But there was definitely a battle yesterday, a battle between this northern mode for severe weather and the southern mode down in Kansas, uh, which uh, yesterday appeared that there was a chance it could even develop just before sunset. Now, though, it looks like everything has kind of shifted toward this northern mode uh, with this surface low dominating. 
Uh, even a little bit of ridging aloft back behind this uh, is going to prevent uh, severe weather from developing down in the southern mode, even through potentially late tonight in Kansas. I do think, though, eventually this front's going to unzip uh, down into eastern Kansas. Uh, but you always want to play the dominant surface low, even in the early season up here. Uh, so if you were going to be chasing all days, you'd want to be in southern Minnesota here, probably have to fly into Minneapolis, rent a car, blow apart the rental car, return the rental car, then fly down to Oklahoma City, rent another car, blow that vehicle apart on Friday and Saturday, probably return the rental, maybe reposition down into Jackson, uh, Mississippi, uh, for the Dixie Alley event, rent another car, blow that apart. Then next thing you know, you're upside down for the season. So that's why it's important uh, to kind of pace yourself and consider logistics when you're forecasting as well. So my plan is to hit the road tomorrow, targeting the Southern Plains, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then the Dixie Alley threat. I'm going to be discussing that next. But first, we've got to discuss this Northern Plains event. This surface low is going to slide right along this warm front. That's going to be lifting into Southern Minnesota by 2 to 3 p.m., and just ahead of these surface lows, you get some enhanced lift. You get coupling with the upper jet. You may remember the tornado last year in the early season that impacted eastern Nashville. That was one that was also coupled with an upper-level jet structure uh, just ahead of a surface low. You'll get a little bit of a channel of a low-level jet, a little enhanced low-level jet just ahead of these surface lows too. So any of these storms that are able to evolve just ahead of that surface low track and along the warm front, We'll have enhanced uh, storm relative helicity and the potential uh, for a tornado threat. Instability is not a problem. We've got plenty of moderate uh, instability up there that's going to lift out ahead of this uh, sur ejecting surface low uh, located over northwestern Iowa by 2 p.m. A little bit slower with the new newer wrap. Here you can see the warm front surging to the north into southern Minnesota uh, with that big-time low-level jet pop. Another limiting factor that could happen with this severe weather event is usually moisture, new moisture like this, is relatively shallow. And we've got a lot of dry air just above the surface surging to the northeast. That's that elevated mixed layer. You get the heating of the day. You get what's called mixing, where that dry air can be mixed down to the surface and overall resulting in less dew points and a little bit of a veering out of that wind. In this case, though, with the stronger surface low and that low-level jet continuing to crank just ahead of it, it can act to pool the moisture along that warm frontal zone, kind of battling against the effects of mixing, which can act to uh, decrease the moisture. Uh, a strong low-level jet will pool that moisture along a warm front like this, uh, leading to more favorable localized thermodynamic conditions along that ejecting warm uh, uh, surface low along the warm front. So according to the wrap in the HRRR, there are definitely not any concerns for thermodynamics. It looks like pooling moisture up here ahead of this uh, strengthening surface low a warm frontal zone uh, helping to act as a barrier uh, for that pooling moisture along it should lead to a relatively favorable corridor for severe weather. And the Storm Prediction Center has added a 5% tornado risk up in this area with this ejecting surface low uh, into southern Minnesota. And uh, much needed, too. Look at the wind shear, the low-level storm relative helicity. Uh, this is basically in the lowest kilometer up there, about 200 to 300 out ahead of that surface low. Uh, right, uh, co-located with that instability. Capes 1,500 to 2,000 ahead of the wrap. The wrap was all over this setup yesterday, too. It uh, accurately predicted the dominance of this northern mode. That's why we're sticking with the wrap, uh, staying loyal to the wrap model here, as it seems to be dominating uh, with this evolution of the northern system. Big 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative felicity across northern Iowa into southeastern Minnesota. Little supercells that are forecast to develop ahead of the surface low. Across uh, south central Minnesota up here definitely is a chance for a tornado threat out ahead of that. And here's the satellite imagery. This is from the Radar Omega app. And uh, you can definitely see some of those tops right now with the morning convection and even some snowflakes as we saw on the surface map. Even though temperatures are in the upper 30s right now. Uh, there is a couple of snowflakes coming down there in far northwestern Iowa. But you can also see the clearing working its way into western Iowa here with that elevated mixed layer, that dry air just above the ground. You can see the winter weather alerts, winter weather advisories, winter storm warnings up there across the Dakotas into uh, uh, the northern Nebraska panhandle in eastern Wyoming. That's the first round where 6 to 10 inches of snow could fall up there. And uh, that's ahead of the big upslope event. Uh, the models are still holding serve. Uh, Colorado Springs to the north, including Denver, getting a couple of feet of snow. There are some failure scenarios for the forecast for Denver for uh, the big snowstorm. 
there could be a bit of a dry slot that comes in just on the south side of that compact Vortmax. So if that Vortmax does take a little bit further of a north track than the models have been showing and that the European model has been hinting at, that could bring a dry slot into the Denver and Colorado Springs area that could uh, uh, prevent some of those monster record-breaking snowfall totals from happening. But even if that happens, I do see 18 to 24 inches falling first across the Denver area, the I-25 corridor into the Colorado foothills. But this is the severe weather setup the day before the day before the day uh, here across northern Iowa and to southern Minnesota that we're watching very closely. This is a little bit of some morning precipitation helping to stabilize this environment a bit, but it is getting displaced rapidly. You can see this clear air, rapid clearing happening across western Iowa. Temperatures rising into the low 60s there, dew points into the 50s. Uh, with that elevated mixed layer working in uh, with the surface low, which right now is located back here across southeastern uh, Nebraska, but it is rapidly ejecting off to the northeast. And this is definitely a setup that's evolving right before our eyes during the day today. You've got new moisture. You've got an intensifying surface low lifting off to the northeast. You've got convection off to the north of that warm frontal zone. So a lot needs to come together in a short amount of time to get that severe weather to happen during the window of about 3 to 6 p.m. there but we're going to be uh, watching it very closely through the day today then i'm going to be hitting the road tomorrow uh, activating storm chase mode for the southern plains extension of this here you can see some of this precipitation happening on the cold side of that warm front so this is as there is a, a low level jet uh lifting up and over that warm frontal boundary you can see kind of the spotter nature spotty nature uh, to these little showers uh, as warm advection is increasing ahead of that advancing surface low, lifting up and over the stable air there. We call that isentropic lift when that's lifting up on a slant-wise surface and leads to this type of a configuration to the precipitation. So with a rapidly evolving system, even though temperatures are in the upper 30s to lower 40s out here across this environment, I do think that uh, that uh, air mass is going to be displaced pretty rapidly. Uh, and uh, it looks like there is going to be a pretty favorable thermodynamic environment and a wind shear environment just ahead of that ejecting surface low along the Iowa and Minnesota border into southern Minnesota. And we're going to be covering this live tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, live Storm Chase EDU class. We do these every week, every Wednesday, exclusively for Facebook supporters, and uh, the link is included in the text of this live, uh, but we're going to be doing that tonight basically now casting uh, for this double-barreled severe weather situation, breaking down the severe weather in southern Minnesota, northern Iowa, and also the potential for nocturnal severe weather across southeastern Kansas uh, with that cold front unzipping and convection developing southwestward along that cold front. And maybe down into southeastern Kansas, there is a threat of some late-night uh, supercells tonight as that uh, late-arriving jet streak uh, to the southern plains finally arrives, leading to some lift. Uh, uh, leading to a low-level jet intensifying as well. The convergence on the north side of that low-level jet, uh, persistent convergence through the night tonight, uh, could develop uh, some severe weather late night tonight uh, through tomorrow morning. But that's what the tonight's class is going to be, is a now cast uh, for this uh, uh, severe weather event, double-barreled severe weather event in southern Minnesota and also the southern plains. So now let's take a, a deeper look at some of the models, uh, including the uh, RAP model here uh, and the HRRR models. Let me flip over and change images here. Here is the surface low right now, located in south central Nebraska there, ejecting off to the northeast. Uh, this is at 14Z this morning, so look how it changes shape. It's egg-shaped here across uh, eastern Nebraska, and as that surface low drops and tightens, coupled uh, with that jet structure, leading to those surface pressure falls, uh, becomes a 996 surface low there across western Iowa. Looks a little bit less compact than the 14Z run of the wrap as compared to the 13Z, but notice how it gets a little bit more of a circular configuration. It's almost like an ejecting trough that goes with a positive tilt to a neutral tilt to a negative tilt. Here that surface low has an egg-shaped positive tilt to its main axis. And then as it gets into western Iowa, you can see it get more circular, almost more of a neutral tilt uh, to that setup. This is the southern mode watching that. This is at 20Z at 2 p.m. 
And you can certainly see uh, the instability maximized off to the north across northwestern Iowa, out ahead of that ejecting surface low. Extending back to the north, we could also watch uh, this track of the surface low in the 14Z. Look at that, how it uh, lifts through eastern Nebraska with basically a positive tilt, kind of an egg-shaped surface low. And then as it gets into northwestern Iowa, gets more of that circular configuration. And that's when storms are going to initiate just off to the northeastern lobe of that surface low near the Iowa-Minnesota border, south-central Minnesota, extending into the southeastern portion of the state just ahead of that ejecting surface low. That's the area that I'm watching uh, very closely for the uh, development of tornadic supercells. We're going to look at the HRRR as well, but look at the new 14Z wrap, really blowing up that helicity. Now we've got a large area of 300 plus 0 to 1 kilometer helicity in north central Iowa into uh, southern Minnesota there. Very favorable wind shear for tornado development. It's just whether the thermodynamics can hang on if these uh, new dew points are able to pool along that warm frontal zone across Minnesota and Iowa. If that can happen, it could lead to a narrow uh, window of favorable thermodynamics uh, co-locating with very strong low-level wind shear for a tornado threat across south-central Minnesota. And here is the HRRR model showing you that uh, surface low in a rough agreement uh, with the RAP model. This is at 19Z. Uh, so that was, we were just looking at the fields for 20Z, uh, showing a 996 uh, millibar surface low. Look at the shape of the surface low here too, relatively uh, circular. You can see kind of a lobe extending off to the northeast of those pressure falls right along that warm frontal zone, showing you the track of that surface low beyond 20Z. It's going to propagate off to the east-northeast right along that warm frontal zone. Surface winds to the south of the warm front are out of the due south, uh, shifting to the north and even northeast to the north. Uh, of that uh, warm frontal zone. Uh, the warm front's expected to lift just a little bit to the north. Uh, you can also see this dry air. Look at the southwesterlies, very strong southwesterlies to the south of that surface low. A little bit of convergence here on the east side of the low as well. Also some convergence along that warm frontal zone to the northeast of that surface low. Those are going to be the two mechanisms of surface convergence to develop uh, supercells this afternoon by about 21Z, an hour after this. Storms are going to develop just to the northeastern lobe of the surface low and then lift off to the northeast. And let's watch the surface low track. This is 21Z, 3 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time, 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. That surface low continues to deepen by 22Z. Uh, this is at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. It's down to 994 millibar low. Uh, you can still see that warm front getting very close to Minneapolis-St. Paul area by 4 p.m. And that's going to bring the severe weather threat and the tornado threat into Minneapolis. We can also look at that low-level jet surge just ahead of the surface low, uh, gusting over 50 knots there, about a kilometer above the ground. A little channel of a low-level jet, too, just ahead of that surface low. Here you can see the 850 low displaced a little bit to the northwest. That tilt with height is uh, definitely helping to intensify that surface low further upon ejection. Uh, along the Minnesota Iowa border here by 22Z or 4 p.m. And the nose of that low level jet is butting up right against uh, that warm frontal zone here across southeastern Minnesota, lifting that warm front all the way up to the Minneapolis St. Paul area by about 4 p.m. there. 5 p.m. continuing to increase up near 60 knots, that low level jet. So definitely some dominance of this jet streak as it lifts off uh, to the northeast. Here's the jet streak punching into western Iowa here. Even goes to show you that the short-range models are pretty inaccurate with this system. Yesterday, kind of having an equal favoritism of the southern mode down in Kansas and the northern mode here, and now it just has one consolidated jet punching through the central plains into Iowa here. That's at 23Z. We could look at some of these conditions out ahead of the surface low. Look at that wind shear, uh, low-level storm relative helicity in the 0 to 1 kilometer layer. Well in excess of 300 here uh, ahead of that surface low beneath the core of that 50 to 60 knot low-level jet there. That's at 23Z. This is by 0Z. Even a greater enhancement of that low-level shear. An excess of 400 0 to 1 kilometer helicities there. See how co-located that is with the three-kilometer cape, and it is quite co-located with that low-level cape there across southeastern Minnesota, even into western Wisconsin there, just to the south 
very close to the Minneapolis St. Paul area. So this is looking relatively favorable for a tornado threat. There is going to be a little bit of a surface low level inversion there that is going to be solidified by the morning precipitation so far today. That's the only limiting factor that I can see. A ton of dry air aloft. Look at this elevated mix layer right there. Stout area of dry air coming in in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. Could serve to cause a little bit of mixing. But dang, southeastern Minnesota looks nuts. And you even have a couple of these supercells up anchored on the warm front here across the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Additional storms develop. Uh, right along the eastern axis of that low-level jet. There you go, three hours before this at 3 p.m. This is when those storms initiate. South-central Minnesota probably will have tornado potential just as they develop there, just uh, to the northeast of that surface low. This is the HRRR. Let's look at the uh, storm relative helicity up co-located with those. And you can kind of see the cold side of the boundary right here, too. See the enhancement of those 0 to 1 kilometer helicities? That's on the cold side of the boundary. But just on the warm side of that boundary, too, you've got a nice blob of pretty strong 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative helicities across northern Iowa into southeastern Minnesota. Let's look at a forecast sounding there. And this is even with more of those due southerlies at ahead of that surface low. 61 over 58. Quite a bit of cape all the way up. Uh, past 300 millibars there, a big elevated mix layer, and a very favorable hodograph for tornadoes with these south-southeasterly surface winds at about 20 knots, south-southwesterly low-level jet at 50 knots, uh, two, three, four, five, six kilometer winds up there, plenty strong to evacuate that rain and hail from the updraft. You've got a northeasterly storm motion at about 40 knots there. All this area within the hodograph curve, and I see that my head is in the way of it, so there it is. There you can see that hodograph. This is as textbook as it can get for tornado potential. Maybe if you were to bring this one kilometer wind back and make it a little bit more due southerly, that could enhance the tornado threat a little bit more. You can see the east uh, due northeasterly storm motion at 40 knots. The uh, three, four, five, and six kilometer winds up here, more than sufficient to evacuate the rain and the hail from the uh, mesocyclone. Due south southeasterly winds at about 20 knots at the surface. One kilometer wind south southwest, close to 50 knots there, and a lot of area contained within that hodograph curve and the storm motion vector. Plenty of uh, directional shear also ahead of the surface low, going from south southeasterly surface winds up to 50 knots just above the ground. As we go every hour or two ahead, the uh, storm relative helicity in the warm side of the system continues to increase as that low level jet blows up above 50 knots. Look at that. And you've even got this uh, band of renegades that develops right in the core of that big-time low-level shear by 23Z. This is at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time across northeastern Iowa into southeastern Minnesota. These definitely have some serious tornado potential as well, even though they're a little bit southeast of the surface low. A little bit of a, a surface inversion, but with such strong mesocyclones, they should easily be able to drill through that. Pretty deep moisture, too. So I actually take back my earlier comment that the new moisture arriving will have a chance to be mixed out. This is pretty deep moisture, according to the HRRR sounding. Quite a bit of dry air aloft, too. A textbook ele elevated mix layer there. It does look like with this eastern band of precipitation, there is a little bit of warming that happens uh, right in the core along the leading edge of that elevated mix layer that could weaken those lapse rates just a bit for this lead mode. But that'll, the weakening thermodynamics will probably be way overcome by these very favorable hodographs here. Big, looping hodograph. Southern, southerly surface winds, south-southeasterly surface winds, even well to the southeast of that surface low track. So you're really not going to depend on this warm frontal zone to get wind shear sufficient for tornadoes. It's really going to be present across this entire blob, southeastern Minnesota, uh, northeastern Iowa including the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. I do expect that warm front to lift pretty close to your location and a lot of 0 to 3 kilometer cape. Not as much where this eastern line develops. So definitely the low-level cape, uh, the lapse rates are enhanced right along that surface low track. 
and a little bit just to its southeast across southeastern Minnesota. It's possible that this line of convection that develops along the front a little bit further to the east uh, is going to be struggling a bit more with lapse rates, but there is an isolated tornado potential with that as well. But I think south central Minnesota into southeastern Minnesota with this three low level cape is definitely the most favorable environment. And we do have a PDS tornado sounding up there in south central Minnesota. Quite a bit of thicker cape up there as well. A more pronounced elevated mix layer helping to steepen those lapse rates a bit more. 62 over 59, pretty deep moisture too across southeastern Minnesota into northeastern Iowa. So a very robust tornado threat is going to be happening here with this. These are very, very favorable uh, forecast photographs, forecast soundings, especially just ahead of that surface low. I'm going nuts as I'm looking at this right now. Probably should have gotten a flight into Minneapolis early this morning. There you can see that big slug of cape as well. Steep lapse rates. Low level cape is quite important. And uh, this is by 6 p.m., uh, 5 to 6 p.m. when the Minneapolis-St. Paul area could have tornadic activity, especially near and just to the south of Minneapolis-St. Paul to the south of that warm front. Those are definitely uh, areas uh, that I'm going to be watching very closely. Should have been storm chasing this event. My concern was that I'd go all the way up to Minneapolis, chase this event, have to return a rental car, fly back down to the Southern Plains in time for Friday, chase that event as well. Instead, I'm going to be leaving, though, tomorrow, driving westbound. I'm going to be heading all the way to the Southern Plains, chasing northwest Texas into southwestern Oklahoma on Friday, western Oklahoma on Saturday. Sunday, I may eject off to the east across eastern Arkansas near the lower Mississippi River Valley. Uh, but then uh, also keeping an eye on the Colorado snow with a couple of feet of snow, uh, including Denver, the I-25 corridor, as well into the uh, Colorado foothills. And then finally by 2Z, that surface little lifts up into the woods here of western Wisconsin. Still a pretty nice low-level jet pop, though, to the east of it. So I'm seeing quite a bit of similarities between this setup and the surface low setup that led to that destructive tornado in Nashville here, where you get very, very favorable parameters, thermodynamic and uh, kinematic parameters, right along this surface low track with a pop of a, in a low-level jet, some more backed low-level winds out there, and a pronounced elevated mix layer, enhancing uh, that instability right along the path of that surface low track. But boy, keep an eye on this event. It does have some failure modes, but overall, I think this is going to be a pretty favorable tornado environment looks like uh, just to the southwest of minneapolis by 22z you're gonna have some surface based storms just ahead of that surface low definitely uh lifting up toward the minneapolis st paul area uh supercells by about 5 to 6 p.m you've got this arc of less healthy storms developing down into northeastern iowa this is the beginning of the southern mode the weaker southern mode as this front's going to unzip with a line of storms developing down through the kansas city area and into eastern Kansas. Look at that f uh, front. And he's still even at 7 p.m., you've got uh, a supercell that's anchored very close to that surface low, right over Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, by about this time, even some supercell structures across western Wisconsin as that surface low is ejecting off to the northeast. And then you get an unzipping, the zipper effect here along the cold front through eastern Iowa, building down into northern Missouri. Look at that thing unzipping textbook and it's possible late night tonight 10 11 p.m that southeastern kansas mode is finally going to initiate but it's definitely looking quite meager during the night tonight down there definitely pure dominance of this northern mode system some uh anti-cyclonic curvature uh to the upper level height contours in its wake and a later arrival of that upper level jet streak Really not allowing the southern mode to materialize. This is at 4Z. A little bit of lightning, maybe some hail down there. But the NAM lost to the RAP and the HRRR models. Definitely looking a lot more favorable for this northern mode. And I'm going to be targeting the southern plains still Friday and Saturday. You can look at some of the new models. We'll go back to the NAM, even though it was quite inaccurate in its handling of this system. Now it's accurate. 
showing that surface flow ejecting across southern Minnesota, northern Iowa, right along the Iowa-Minnesota border there. And this is on Saturday at 0Z. Nice line of storms here moving through central Oklahoma, according to the NAM. Very strong low-level jet, too, on Saturday. Likely tornado event. On Saturday, this is on Friday, just as the low-level jet is starting to intensify. Friday looks like the day before the day out here, so I'm going to be leaving tomorrow to chase this event. You can see a nice blob of instability down there across West Texas. So it looks like Friday could be more of a southern panhandle, West Texas hill country type of an event. Modern instability, 1,500 plus uh, surface base cape developing there. And then now that Saturday is within the NAM envelope on Saturday, you kind of have this skinny cape axis lifting up through central Oklahoma. Thermodynamically challenged so far. Uh, in the early runs of the NAM here. It is the early season, uh, but there is going to be pretty favorable wind shear with this. And I bet as we get closer to this event, you're going to see better instability develop along this dry line into central Oklahoma with some very favorable low-level wind shear out there for a tornado threat. Uh, thermodynamics, though, have some work to do with that line coming through on Saturday. But the Storm Prediction Center has a slight risk for that blob of moderate instability across West Texas on Friday. On uh, Saturday, uh, they also have a risk. And then on Sunday, as that system ejects across the lower Mississippi River Valley, there's yet another risk extending off to the east there through portions of Dixie. Bowling ball of a system kind of trying to eject here on Sunday, bringing that severe weather across portions of Dixie Alley, at least according to the GFS model. You start getting out here in the long range, and these models just don't do as well. But here is the instability that builds in on Tuesday across eastern Texas, in the GFS at least. This is the uh, early next week event I was telling you about. Uh, forecast confidence with this little gipper of a system, though, is still quite low. But this ejects on Tuesday into the middle portion of next week. And uh, this is definitely going to be something that Dixie Alley needs to watch as well. This is about the 16th, 17th out here. does look like portions of uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee need to watch this system. Another storm system coming in here as well. Kind of has split flow with this jet lifting way to the north and then these waves still coming in here across the western U.S. Kind of a weird early season pattern that we're in right now. And then it looks like in the long range toward the end of March, we might start to get more of a consolidated jet structure across the U.S. And this is probably when the real heart of tornado season is going to begin. You can see these troughs have a tendency to deepen over the western U.S. due to that negative PDO in combination with a positive NPO. So this is probably going to be the late March signal here as severe weather season continues to ramp up. So that's what we're looking at so far, folks. I think that the uh, severe weather threat today is pretty substantial. We can go back to the slight risk. Probably need to boost that northern mode up to an enhanced risk uh, as, these, as the models, as we go through the day, if the short-range models continue to agree on this prime environment across southeastern Minnesota into northern Iowa, uh, even up into western Wisconsin, up into the, the, the woods there of western Wisconsin to the northeast of Minneapolis, St. Paul, definitely has a chance of a supercells and a tornado threat. The southern mode, though, I think that uh, the severe weather threat is subsiding dramatically over the night tonight. Wouldn't be surprised to see that uh, dropping back uh, to a marginal risk out there. Uh, but definitely some things to watch. Big severe weather happening, and it's the early season, so a lot of times these target areas come together at the last second. Thank you guys for tuning in to my morning weather briefing. 
Tonight at 7 p.m., exclusive Storm Chase EDU class as we're going to break down these respective environments. Real-time now casting as severe weather will be unfolding across southeastern Minnesota into western Wisconsin. Never stop chasing.